Good morning, friends. Happy Monday. Welcome to our live online program entitled Prophetic Perspectives, where we take a fresh look at the prophecies of God's word and we receive empowerment for living victorious, successful, and empowering lives. I thank God for bringing us to another Monday. I thank God for his word. And I just want to encourage you right about now to grab the Bible. We're about to dive right in. And we are in Daniel chapter five. We are taking time to read through scripture, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And as I mentioned a few presentations ago, that I am taking a four step approach. I'm taking a four step approach to our reflections here in scripture. And I'm using the acronym PRAY, P R A Y, the acronym P R A Y. P is for pray. We begin by praying, by inviting the spirit to enlighten us as we open the word of God. R is for read. After we pray, we then read. We take time to read, just, just read through scripture. And after we read, the A in for pray is for assimilate, where we take time to assimilate. We take time to reflect. We take time to digest upon what we have read. And then finally, we um, end with why healed, where we surrender, we submit ourselves to that which we have, we have read and reflected upon. And so before we open the word of God, please grab your Bibles. Um, I want us to pray. Let us, let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, dear God, for this morning. Thank you, dear Father, for your word. Thank you, dear Father, for another opportunity we have to be a part of this series prophetic perspectives and as we as we read your word this morning dear father may you may you minister your word to our minds to our hearts may your word bring revival may your word bring renewal may your word bring transformation we pray in christ's name amen i'm reading from daniel 5 daniel chapter 5 we are almost halfway by Wednesday, we will be halfway in the book of Daniel. And we will only have after Wednesday, uh, six more chapters to go in the book of Daniel. Um, Daniel chapter five, it's, uh, it's a little longer, it's a longer chapter. It has about 30 verses, but we want 31 verses, but we want to take time to just read it. And so please join me if you can find the NLT, the New Living Translation um, on the internet, please just um, connect to it. Or if not, just follow in whatever translation you have. Daniel 5. Many years later, King Belshazzar gave a great feast for a thousand of his nobles. And he drank wine with them. The Bible says, while Belshazzar was drinking wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver cups that his predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem. Now, some translations refer to um, Nebuchadnezzar as Belshazzar's father, but he wasn't actually Belshazzar's father. And I'll explain as we go along in our reflection this morning. My translation actually um, translates it as predecessor, which is a more accurate translation. So Nebuchadnezzar was his, pre, was his um, predecessor. or um, um, It says he, he wanted to drink from them with his nobles, his wives, and his concubines. Verse 3, so they brought these gold cups taken from the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines drank from them. While they drank from them, the Bible says in verse 4, they praised their idols made of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Suddenly, they saw the fingers of a human hand writing on the plaster wall of the king's palace near the lampstand. The king himself saw the hand as it wrote, and his face turned pale with fright. His knees knocked together in fear, and his legs gave way beneath him. Verse 7, the king shouted for the enchanters, astrologers, and fortune tellers to be brought before him. 
he said to these wise men of Babylon, whoever can read this writing and tell me what it means will be dressed in purple robes of royal honor and will have a gold chain placed around his neck. He will become the third highest ruler in the kingdom. But when all the king's wise men had come in, none of them could read the writing or tell him what it meant. So the king grew even more alarmed and his face turned pale, his nobles too were shaken. But when the queen mother heard what was happening, she hurried to the banquet hall. She said to Belshazzar, long live the king, don't be so pale and frightened. There is a man in your kingdom who has within him the spirit of the holy gods. During Nebuchadnezzar's reign, this man was found to have insight, understanding, wisdom like that of the gods, your predecessor, the king, your your predecessor, King Nebuchadnezzar, made him chief over all the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, fortune tellers of Babylon. This man, Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar, has exceptional ability and is filled with divine knowledge and understanding. He can interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve difficult problems. Call for Daniel, and he will tell you what the writing means. So Daniel was brought in before the king. The king asked him, are you Daniel? One of the exiles brought from Judah by my predecessor, King Nebuchadnezzar. I have heard that you have the spirit of the gods within you and that you are filled with insight, understanding and wisdom. My wise men, and enchanters have tried to read the words on the wall and tell me their meaning, but they cannot do it. I am told that you can give interpretations and solve difficult problems. If you can read these words and tell me their meaning, you will be clothed in purple robes of royal honor and you will have a gold chain placed around your neck. You will become third highest ruler in the kingdom. That is the king speaking to Daniel. Listen to Daniel's response now to the king in verse 17 of Daniel 5. Daniel answered the king, keep your gifts. Give them to someone else. But I will tell you what the writing means. Your majesty, the most high God, gave sovereignty, majesty, honor, and glory to your predecessor Nebuchadnezzar. He made him so great that people of all races and nations and language trembled before him in fear. He killed those he wanted to kill and spared those he wanted to spare. He honored those he wanted to honor and disgraced those he wanted to disgrace. But when his heart and mind were puffed up with arrogance, he was brought down from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. He was driven from human society. He was given the mind of a wild animal and he lived among the wild donkeys. He ate grass like a cow and he was drenched with the dew of heaven until he learned that the most high God rules over the kingdoms of the world and appoints anyone he desires to rule over them. You are his predecessor, you are his successor, O Belshazzar. And you knew all this, yet you have not humbled yourself, for you have proudly defied the Lord of heaven and have, and have had these cups from his temple brought before you. You and your nobles and your wives and concubines have been drinking wine from them while praising the gods of silver, gold, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Gods that neither see nor hear nor know anything at all. But you have not honored the God who gives the breath of life and controls your destiny, verse 24. So God has sent this hand to write this message. This is the message that was written, many, many tekel parsin, 
This is what the words mean. Many means numbered. God has numbered the days of your reign and has brought it to an end. Tekel means weighed. You have been weighed on the balances and not measured up. Parzin means divided. Your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Verse 29, then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was dressed in purple robes. A gold chain was hung around his neck and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. That very night, that very night, Belshazzar, the Babylonian king, was killed, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. Here ends the ending of Daniel chapter Daniel chapter five. I mentioned I mentioned uh, earlier that um, as we read, you would notice that some translations would uh, translate a Nebuchadnezzar as Belshazzar's father, but that is not um, a very accurate translation as we see the term father in our contemporary age. Well, it's not that it is wrong because in the Bible, the term father is used uh, synonymously with ancestor. For instance, when you get to the, to the New Testament, even in the New Testament, I think is in Luke chapter one, verse 32, in Luke one, verse 32, uh, David is, is described as the father of Jesus. But we all know that David was not the father of Jesus. He was an ancestor, a distant ancestor. So father here in probably in your translation in Daniel 5 is used within the context of ancestor or forefather. Nebuchadnezzar wasn't uh, Belshazzar's biological father. Belshazzar's biological father was Nabonidus. Now, Belshazzar was related to Nebuchadnezzar because uh, Belshazzar's father, Nabonidus, married Nebuchadnezzar's daughter. And their union gave birth to Belshazzar. So therefore, Nebuchadnezzar was, would have been Belshazzar's grandfather. I want you to notice something as we read. In verses 1 to 4, you see a new Babylonian king taking over in the person of Belshazzar. And he takes irreverence and disrespect for God to the next level. He throws a party, a party which has about... Uh, a thousand individuals in attendance and they begin to drink alcohol. They begin to party and get drunk. And Belshazzar orders that the sacred utensils which were taken from the temple of Jehovah in Jerusalem be brought into his dance hall. And they defiled the sacred utensils of God with alcohol and with reveling. In other words, he was, he was totally disregarding and disrespecting the authority of the true God, Jehovah. You know, as you read on in Daniel 5, in verses 5 to 6, uh, it, it, it's, it's very interesting. You know, they are drinking, they are listening to the music, they are dancing, they are boogieing down, they are whining and grinding on the dance floor. And um, they are intoxicated. They, uh, they, they are caught up in an intoxicated stupor they are drunk people are stumbling all over the dance floor you know you know you know that you are really drunk when you can't even keep or maintain your dance moves you you begin to just go all over the place they they are drunk and it's interesting as you read on in verses five to six it's amazing how the power of god can make you go from drunk to sober in a second they were all drunk. 
they were all reveling. They were all partying. They were all, they were all boogieing down on the dance floor. They were stumbling in their drunken stupor. But when God showed up in the form of that hand writing a message of judgment on the wall of the dance hall, every single individual who was drunk stood at attention. Nobody was wobbling. Nobody was drunk. Nobody was was drunk they they, 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 they they became arrested by the by the manifestation of God's presence and as we continue reading on you know everybody in the party is, is quiet because this message of 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 this 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 mysterious this this esoteric message is on the wall and nobody can interpret it and it stops the party and of course the story tells us that Belshazzar sends for his wise men his enchanters his fortune tellers to come in and to 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 interpret the message but they couldn't and then the queen mother referred him or recommended him to Daniel now it's interesting how Belshazzar addresses Daniel you know, I, I take offense to how Belshazzar addresses Daniel. Understand this. Daniel isn't a spring chicken. He has been in Babylon for years as a statesman. He has been in Babylon for years as an individual whose wisdom and whose mental acumen way surpass that of the wise men of Babylon. And listen to how this new king on the block addresses my friend Daniel in verse 13. In verse 13, he says to Daniel, in verse 13, are you, Daniel, one of the exiles or one of the slaves brought from Judah by my predecessor, King Nebuchadnezzar? What disrespect, what an insult. What an insult. Did, 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 did Belshazzar not know that it was Daniel who was running the entire empire when his grandfather, King Nebuchadnezzar, was in the forest eating grass like a cow for seven years? Did Belshazzar not, not know that? But you know, Daniel didn't even allow the king's disrespect to deter him or to distract him. Daniel was so focused on his mission, so focused on his purpose, so focused on the honor and glory of God. Daniel just caused that to slide off his back like water. And if, as you go on to read, you come to verses 17 to 23, these seven verses are very instructive and very enlightening. Daniel 5, 17 to 23, seven verses. These seven verses give us the context of God's judgment. God is about to bring judgment upon Babylon. God is about to bring judgment upon King Belshazzar and his entire empire, Babylon. And when we speak about judgment, we need to understand what the context of judgment is because many individuals, when they hear judgment, they think of an angry God who's about to lose his cool and lose his mind on his creation. They think about almost a figure like the Incredible Hulk. When you get the Incredible Hulk angry, he, he literally begins to expand and his, and his buttons begin to pop and his muscles appear and he just begins to wreak havoc on the individuals who are tormenting him, who are frustrating him. God is not the Incredible Hulk. God is not a God who gets out of control. God is not a God who is driven by rage. On the contrary, God is always driven by love. God is a God of love. And so if you take time carefully to read these seven verses, Daniel 5, 17 to 23, you will recognize that the context of God's judgment is never divine rage. It is always human will. Don't miss that. Don't miss that. I'll say it again. The context of God's judgment is never divine rage. It is always human will. 
So in the judgment, what God is doing is that God, the king of the universe, God, the creator of the universe, God, the salvation of the the salvation of humanity, what God does in judgment is that God submits to the will of humanity. That's what God does. That's what God does. In judgment, God isn't driven by an uncontrolled rage. In judgment, he's submitting to the will of humanity. He's saying, I love you so much that I will allow you to have your way. The context of God's judgment is God's love. A love that loves you so, so much to let you have your own way, even if it means breaking the heart of the God who loves you. I want you to observe that sin does not need God's contribution to work out your destruction. I'm going to repeat that. Sin doesn't need God's contribution to work out your destruction. God, as a matter of fact, is not destructive. God is creative. That's how the Bible introduces God. The Bible introduces God as the one who created everything that we see as the one who manifests himself as light that dispels darkness in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was without form and void, Genesis 1, 1 to 3. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. You know, Genesis 1, 1 to 3 doesn't end with verse 3. The continuation of Genesis 1, 1 to 3 is John chapter 1, verse 5. I said the continuation of Genesis 1, 1 to 3 is John chapter 1, verse 5. So check it out. Genesis 1, 3. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. John 1, verse 5. And the light shone into the darkness and the darkness could not overcome it. God is not destructive, God is creative. Sin, on the other hand, is inherently, eternally, and progressively destructive. That's why I said that sin does not need God's contribution to work out your destruction. Let me, let me reveal to you that it is sin that is destructive. Turn with me to the book of James. James is in the New Testament. And um, we need to wrap this up really soon. I always get carried away when I start speaking about the word of God. But um, I'm going to try to release you guys very soon. James chapter 1. James is after the book of Hebrews. And I want to read. I want to show you that it is not God that is destructive but it is sin that's destructive. James chapter one. And when you get to chapter one, I want us to read from verse 13 to verse 15. And here's what it says. James 1, 13 to 15 says, and remember when you are being tempted, do not say God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong and he never tempts anyone else. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. There it is. Sin is a destructive reality. In John 10, verse 10, the Bible declares that the thief uh, referring to the enemy comes for to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But Jesus Christ has come that we might have life and have life more abundantly. As we go on reading, as we go on reading, I mentioned, I mentioned, I mentioned that these seven verses in, in Daniel 5, Daniel 5, 17 to 23, gives us the context of God's judgment, revealing that God's judgment 
is never driven by divine rage, but by human will. The context of God's judgment is love, a love that loves you too much to let you have, a love that loves you so much that it lets you have your own way, even if your own way means breaking the heart of the God who loves you. And so in Daniel 7, 24, it highlights God's submission to Belshazzar's mission. That's what's happening here in Babylon. God sees Babylon. God sees Babylon defying him. God sees King Nebuchadnezzar, King, King Belshazzar defying him. So what God does is that God says, okay, you want to defy me? I'm going to submit to you defying me. Understand this. When I submit to you defying me, what I'm actually doing is that I'm handing you over to your own mission. I am submitting to your mission so that your mission can work out that which it will inevitably work out, which is destruction because sin leads to destruction. In verse 29, in verse 29, Belshazzar's response amazes me. You know how Daniel 5 ends? It just blows my mind. It blows my mind. It blows my mind. Because Daniel 5 begins by Belshazzar disregarding, disrespecting the authority of Almighty God in his drunken stupor, Belshazzar. He's mocking God. He gets drunk. He desecrates the sacred utensils of the house of God. God shows up in the banquet hall and writes a message of judgment, a message of doom upon Nebuchadnezzar, upon, upon Belshazzar. And Belshazzar's response amazes me. You know, I, I need to read it because to me, his response doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. Let me, let, me, let me read it for you. Let me read for you. Let me read for you. Let me read for you. In verse 29, the Bible says, at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was dressed in purple robes, a gold chain was hung around his neck, and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom of Babylon. So wait, wait, wait. Daniel just comes into the party. And Daniel brings a message of doom upon the king. And the king rewards Daniel. <laughs> that, that, that to me is amazing. <clears throat> I mean, I'm just thinking like, you would think that the king would probably have a reaction like, like um, king, king Ahab in the Old Testament with Elijah. Whenever the prophet Elijah would come to King Ahab, and bring a message that did not resonate with Ahab, that did not make Ahab look good, that did not speak prosperity to Ahab's life, Ahab would just rebuke and try to kill Elijah. But here, Daniel is bringing the message of doom to Belshazzar, for Belshazzar's disrespect and disregard of God, and Belshazzar doesn't try to kill Daniel. On the contrary, he promotes Daniel. He promotes Daniel for bringing a message of doom and destruction to him. I believe that the reason why Belshazzar had this response that was, that was contra-human is because he acknowledged the justice, sovereignty, and love of God. Belshazzar recognized, he recognized that in God judging him, God was actually submitting to his Belshazzar's mission. You know, I don't know how many Christians would have such an impressive response as Belshazzar. I know sometimes even when I preach and when um, members hear me say things that um, don't resonate with their whims and their fancies, when people hear me say things that, that um, probably offend them, from the word of God, people, people try to attack me. They, they get angry with me. Are you with me? And, um, you know, people put up walls of defense. People try to attack the preacher and undermine the preacher, but not with Belshazzar. Belshazzar, this pagan king, 
when he received the judgment of God, he submitted to it because he recognized that God's judgment is based on God's love, a love that loves you so much that he will allow you to have your way, even if your way means hurting him. You know, as we move from, we have, we have prayed, we have read, we have assimilated what we've read. Now let's move to why in prayer healed. My friends, the day will come when you will have your final drink. That's what the story of Belshazzar tells us. The day will come when you will go to your final party. The day will come when you will engage in your final act of revelry. The day will come when you will lie for the last time. The day will come when you will steal for the last time. The day will come when you will gossip for the last time. The day will come when you will fornicate for the last time. The day will come when you will rebel for the last time. The day will come when you will grieve God's spirit for the last time. There is a last time for every person and for everything on this earth. And for many of us, my friends, the reality is that it is sooner than we think. Life is so uncertain. We are here today. We are gone tomorrow. None of us know whether this is our last day on the planet. None of us know None of us knows whether this is the last sermon we will ever hear. That's why God wants us to live every single day as if it were our last for his honor and for his glory. As I close, as I close, I want to read uh, two verses for you from the penultimate book of the Bible, the book of Jude. Uh, Jude chapter 1, and I want to read verses 24 and 25, and I want to leave you with this admonition. Jude 1, 24 and 25. The devil is seeking to demoralize you, to destroy you with the strongholds of sin that he has placed on the inside of you. But know this, my friends, Jesus Christ has come to break the stronghold and to break the stranglehold of sin. Jude 1, 24 and 25. Now all glory to God who is able to keep you from falling away and will bring you with great joy into his glorious presence without a single fault. All glory to him who alone is God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. All majesty, glory, power, and authority are his before all time and in the presence and beyond all time. Amen. Today, I want to commit to you. I want to lead you to surrender to the power of God, the only power in the universe that is able to protect you and to deliver you and to rescue you from the power of sin, from the dominion of sin. The only power that is able to fortify you in order for you to live in the victorious, conquering presence of God. I want to invite you, my friends, to surrender to that power. Don't be like Belshazzar, who surrendered himself to the powers of his passions, his lusts, and his carnal desires. Be like Daniel who in the midst of a depraved society, in the midst of a pagan world, surrendered himself totally to the power and anointing of the Holy Spirit. And God's anointing and God's power led him progressively into his divine destiny. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you, dear God, for your word. Thank you, dear God, for this reflection we've had on Daniel chapter 5. Father, we don't want to be like Belshazzar. We want to be like Daniel. We want to be sold out to you. We want to be fully committed to you. We want to be fully devoted to you, dear Father. We want to be fully surrendered to you, Father. So even now, dear God, may you create a shift in our minds, create a shift in our hearts, create a transformation in our lives, and bring us, dear Father, lead us to fully surrender to your love, your power, 
your anointing and your glory, Father. May today be our best day ever as we intentionally walk in your anointing, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. My friends, God bless you. Have yourself a great day. I want to see you back on Wednesday at 7 a.m. Mountain Time, 9 a.m. Eastern Time as we move into Daniel 6 and we continue our series entitled Prophetic Perspectives. God bless you and have a great day.